So what makes plant-based diets so effective? Well, whole food plant-based diets put a lid on the drivers of insulin resistance. Inflammation, oxidative stress, lipotoxicity, and dysbiosis. And we'll talk about all four of those. So how does inflammation drive insulin resistance? Well, inflammation is caused by excess body fat, especially visceral fat, which promotes the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the inflammation that results from that interferes with insulin signaling, increasing insulin resistance. And if you look at plant-based eaters, we had a, a meta-analysis in 2016 that showed that people eating plant-based um, have reduced inflammatory profiles, reduction in CRP, and this was, you know, 29 studies. Uh, and, and looking at 100% plant-based or vegan diets, uh, we had two studies, one from Brazil in 2017, the CRP levels in vegans averaged 0.5 milligrams per liter, compared to lacto-ovo vegetarians at 0.8 and omnivores at 1.1. And the second study was from the United States in 2007, and this was uh, fairly high raw vegans looking at CRP levels, and it was 0.52 in the vegans. And in endurance athletes, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, it was 0.75. Uh, and, and so 0.75 in the endurance athletes who were omnivores, not, not uh, vegetarians. And then people eating a uh, Western diet, it was 2.61. And, and so quite a lot higher than the omnivores in Brazil, probably because the diet is so much worse in the United States. Uh, oxidative stress is the second driver. Oxidative stress damages proteins, DNA, cell membranes. It promotes insulin resistance, beta cell damage, impaired glucose tolerance, and it promotes the complications of diabetes. So there's a definite advantage for people eating plant-based. Studies very consistently demonstrate that people eating plant-based diets have more favorable antioxidant status than omnivores, and that's probably because they eat more antioxidants and they eat fewer pro-oxidants. And so you can see a number of studies uh, quoted there. Lipotoxicity is one that you, you may not be as, uh, as familiar with. And lipotoxicity is very simply the accumulations uh, or the accumulation of fats in non-adipose tissue. So we have this remarkable uh, tissue to store limitless amounts of fat, and it's called adipose tissue, our fat tissue. And, and so when, sometimes when too much is coming in for our body to deal with it, we can't send it to adipose tissue fast enough. What ends up happening is fat gets stored in our vital organs, the liver, the heart, the pancreas, and also in our muscle tissue as intramyocellular lipids. And this causes cell damage or cell death in some cases, tissue inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, and insulin resistance. And, and it elevates triglycerides as well, and blood glucose. So what causes lipotoxicity? Well, it's caused by overconsumption of food, leading to overweight and obesity. Diets that are high in fat, saturated fat, and or trans fatty acids are particularly problematic. And diets that are high in refined carbohydrates, especially sugars, also contribute to lipotoxicity. And we know there's an advantage for plant-based eaters. So people eating 100% uh, plant-based have the lowest rates of overweight and obesity of all dietary patterns. They have lower levels of lipids in our muscles, so intramyocellular lipids, which are a marker of toxicity, than matched omnivores. They have the lowest intakes of saturated fat of all dietary patterns as well. And then the fourth driver of insulin resistance is called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is really just an unhealthy gut flora. And so dysbiosis has been linked with obesity, inflammation, and insulin resistance, 
all leading to the, to, the, to the development of type 2 diabetes. And the key mechanisms of action are that, that dysbiosis increases gut permeability, allowing things that shouldn't get into the bloodstream in, and that can cause inflammation. Increased production of cytokines, which are these inflammatory uh, compounds. And it can cause metabolic endotoxemia because the, um, the gram-negative bacteria uh, that die release these endotoxins that can get into the, to the system and increase insulin resistance. So what causes dysbiosis? Well, unhealthy Western-style diets are a huge driving factor. Refined carbohydrates, processed foods, high meat, high fat diets, low fiber diets, alcohol, chemical, chemical contaminants in the food supply can all contribute to dysbiosis. Antibiotics, medications, stress, and poor dental hygiene are all important contributing factors to an unhealthy gut microbiome. So again, we see a plant-based advantage, and we have a couple of studies a study from Brazil looking at about 268 participants. And vegans in this study had the most favorable microbiota, followed by lacto-ovo-vegetarians. And the conclusions of the author were that exposure to animal foods may favor an intestinal environment, which could trigger systemic inflammation and insulin resistance. In the second study from Italy, they found it was a smaller study, but lacto-ovo vegetarians and vegan diets resulted in a more favorable microflora than omnivorous diets, but the lacto-ovo vegetarian diet was even more favorable than the vegan diet in this particular case. So what we know is the most effective dietary patterns minimize pathogenic dietary components or harmful components and maximize protective dietary components. And if we think about the factors in the diet that are most protective, we think of things like fiber and phytochemicals and plant enzymes and antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds and plant sterols and stanols and pre and probiotics and macronutrients when they come from healthy sources with all of the above, and micronutrients the same with all of the above. And when you look at that list, something that just stands out or even leaps out off the page at you is that every single one of these in particular comes either exclusively or predominantly from plant foods. Fiber comes only from plants. Phytos, phytochemicals only plants, plant enzymes only plants that can help convert phytochemicals into their bioactive metabolites or their active forms. And anti-inflammatory compounds, mostly plants. Plant sterols and stanols, only plants. You, you get the picture. This is where the stuff in food that protects us is concentrated. And then if we think about the pathogenic factors, the trans fatty acids, excessive saturated fat, refined carbohydrates, excessive sodium, chemical contaminants, products of high temperature cooking, pro-oxidants, new 5GC, TMAO, endotoxins, if you look at this list, it is two categories of foods. Then, and, and the World Health Organization named those two categories of foods back in 1990. The categories of foods that are most, you know, most profoundly contributing to disease risk are processed foods and animal products. And so again, if you look at this list, trans, whoops, sorry about that. Trans fats are, are predominantly, well, they used to be predominantly in processed foods. Now they've been taken out of processed foods. You get them predominantly in animal products. But animal products, uh, processed foods, processed foods, uh, chemical contaminants tend to move up the food chain. So a lot of, in animal foods, products of high temperature cooking, fried foods, um, uh, processed foods, pro-oxidant like heme iron in meat. New 5GC is a pro-inflammatory molecule in meat. Uh, endotoxins from the gram-negative bacteria, you know, dead bacteria, and that's mainly in ground meat. You, you, again, you, you just get the picture. You know, and the picture is that most of what people eat in, in North America is a threat to health. 
And uh, fortunately, we have a choice as human beings about what we put in our mouth. There is no doctor or dietitian that can eat for you.